but as Tanner said, I'm Christine Anderson from Beacon Health Options. Um, I am a clinician by trade. I'm also an EMDR trained therapist, so I love hearing that, um, and really cut my teeth on acute care, um, focusing mostly on younger children and then moving into adults, but a lot of my clinical training came from that highly acute care training. Okay. <laughs> um, so for me, going from that highest level, most acute type of care into this lower level, community-based um, primary care practice was a real shift for me. Um, and I've noticed a lot of folks in the room have come from that private practice, community level, and working on kind of how do we bridge that gap between the highest levels of care and meeting those clients' needs when they come out of those highest levels of care. Um, so it's kind of a different perspective for me, but definitely an enjoyable one. Um, before we get started, I did want to take just a little bit of time to talk about Beacon Health Options and how we sort of fit into the BHO and who the heck the BHO is, um, because this is something that I really actually spend a decent amount of time explaining. Um, and for the people at Beacon, um, it's just like, oh, everyone should know that. And coming from outside going into managed care, um, I was one of those people that said, I have no idea what that actually means. So I wanted to address this a little bit. So what we've got up here are the eight centers for mental health, uh, community centers for mental health in the different areas. All eight of these different centers plus Beacon make up Colorado Health Partnership, so CHP. CHP is the BHO, not Beacon. So that's one of the things I always like to clear up is that, you know, we're often associated as Beacon is the BHO, but it really is a partnership between these eight community mental health centers and Beacon. So it's a really unique setup. Um, the other reason I want to take the time to explain this is because this is how our programs are funded. Our, fun, our programs are funded through this partnership of these eight mental health centers plus Beacon, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So I do want to um, talk a little bit about why integrated care and why psychiatric access programs. And some of this is probably going to be redundant from some of the great presentations we've already had, so bear with me. Um, but one of the first primary pieces we have to talk about is the psychiatric shortage. Um, and not just in the state of Colorado, but really across the nation, but because we're here and we're serving the population here, um, we do want to talk about that real extreme shortage that is pushing a lot of these patients into the primary care setting because there may not be a psychiatrist available whether they need it or not or the closest available psychiatrist is hours away and maybe that client or patient has transportation issues so getting to actually see that psychiatrist is a real barrier and so there's lots and lots of layers to this so this is one of the reasons that we worked on kind of integration and um, psychiatric access programs so we've talked a lot about this but primary care is the gateway it has become the de facto treatment setting for clients in mental health issues. Um, and it's for a lot of reasons. And it's not necessarily that people mean to go to their primary care professional for mental health reasons, but that's their trusted provider. That's who they see for their wellness checks. That's who their kids see for their annual visits, their immunizations. That's who you go to see for your referrals to another specialist. So it is the landing place and that kind of gateway for a lot of these patients to get to other care. Um, and really, the primary care providers are the people who are there for those patients throughout their lifespan. Um, it's very common that a whole family comes into a practice, and you see that whole family through their entire course of life. They trust that practice. They trust those providers. And even when maybe a primary physician retires or moves, they'll continue seeing that practice because they feel comfortable. They feel safe. They trust those people from the front door to the back door. They know the nurses. There is a reason that those clients keep going there. So they trust those providers when they say, I think we need to work on some behavioral health. I think we need to work on, you know, whatever it is. So there's a real inherent trust in that relationship. So primary care being that kind of gateway, um, I'll move, we, we already addressed most of those, so I'll skip a couple of these if they're redundant. Um, so understanding just how impactful um, physical, mental health is on physical health is really key to understanding 
why we should even care about integration, why we should even bother with this. Um, and there's a couple different estimates you'll see anywhere from one in four to one in five adults have diagnosable mental illness. And that mental, those with mental illnesses actually will, um, are projected to die sooner than the general population. And that there's more co-occurring health conditions with those who also have those mental health chronic, or those health chronic conditions. So think about that. When you're seeing clients in your practice, one in four of the patients, one of every four patients that you see in a day has a diagnosable mental health condition, whether you are aware of it or not. So we've got kind of the 10 most common complaints that people come in for. I'm sure these are not a surprise to any of you. And then we have the chronic conditions that require a behavioral health component as a standard of care. And then we have the co-occurrence between those chronic health conditions and mental illness. And it's quite clear, um, you can see from that big red line, mental illness is that big percentage that goes along with all those um, or med medical conditions, sorry. <laughs> so by some estimates, 60 to 70% of patients leave a medical setting without receiving any treatment for a behavioral health component. I mean, that's a pretty significant number. And they leave that medical home without receiving that treatment, even though it increases the odds that that patient will not be compliant with the medical treatment that they are receiving. So that's a pretty big gap. So you may be thinking to yourself, you know what? I, I refer my patients out. You know, I connect them with a, a community provider. I give them that referral. I give them that list. And that's got to be good enough, right? Well, as we've talked about today, by some estimates, 50% of them won't even actually go to see that mental health provider, even though you could have made the most stellar recommendation to them. You could have laid out the best case, and that patient will still not go for, for a myriad of reasons. And we've talked about stigma being one of those big ones. So I go back to that power of choosing your primary care. You know, that relationship and that rapport and that trust and that feeling and sense of family that patients really do get from going to see their primary providers. And then conversely, I want you to think about that overwhelming stigma that goes with seeing that mental health provider and, you know, the fear of the couch. And, you know, dare I say, you're going to go see a psychiatrist. You know, it's like, ooh, no one wants to say that because you're worried about how your patients are going to react. And patients are significantly worried about how that makes them look, right? And especially in really small communities, everyone knows where the dentist's office is, everyone knows where the primary care office is, and everybody knows where the mental health office is, right? And so there is that stigma of, I don't want my car to be seen parked out front. And that's really, that's very real for our patients. So kind of, even when you're making that referral and thinking, yep, I sold them on, got it, I got it, right? They still really, you, you may think they've got it when they leave and you see them for the next visit. And let's say you, re, you ask and say, how was that? And they go, you know, they kind of trail off. So you always have to kind of remember that, even though there's that clear link between behavioral health and mental health, people don't always, um, aren't always open to those services. So this is where integrated practices come in, and this is a lot of what we've been talking about. And there's tons and tons of research out there um, from various pilot programs, um, and some of them show that there's at least a 50% better compliance with mental health care when it's offered in the primary care setting, at least 50%. We've seen much higher estimates. Um, and that complex patients with a chronic illness that need behavioral health are, like, are more likely to be compliant with that mental health treatment when it's coordinated with their medical care. So even if it's just coordinated, let's say we're not even at integration yet, but if you are coordinating that behavioral health with their medical health, they're more likely to be compliant, which for your chronically, physically ill patients, that is a really big, big step. And we talked about too, you know, having that integrated practice frees up a lot of the primary care practices time to spend time with other patients while still knowing that their patients are getting the best care, that you've handed them off and that their needs are still being met. And that patient is going to leave your practice feeling really satisfied with the services that they got and you can move to the next patient. So there's a real confidence that comes with that. So to demonstrate the impact of integration, this is just one example of a pilot um, where we had 170 people with mental illness go into an integration program for one year. So this is very small. Um, after one year in this program, 
they determined that there were significant savings to patients, both in money, but also in experience. They had fewer nights of homelessness. They had less hospitalizations for mental health issues, less days in detox, fewer ER visits. And that is just for this one tiny program. So even though you may be looking at the cost savings for just your practice, um, the cost savings to the entire community is pretty significant. And, then, and like I said, this is just a very small example. So integrated practices, we've talked about integrated practices are the best. Like that is the gold standard. That's the thing that we all want, that behavioral health professional in the primary office that can do the warm handoffs and do the assessments and go into the rooms. You have one EHR that everyone's documenting in. Like that's our pie in the sky dream, right? Like that's where we all want to get. The reality is that may not be where everyone can be right now. Um, and we know that that's the future and we know that that's the best case scenario. But we've talked about a couple of these other ones where you have a few other options, where you have co-located um, and then you have coordinated. So even if we're doing some of that, that is a great step in the right direction. So I wanna talk about um, whether you have an integrated practice or a non-integrated practice psychiatric access programs can support you. So even if you're like, you know what, we're integrated, we're good, we don't need psychiatric access, there is still a gap to be filled, filled with that psychiatric um, shortage that we've got in our state, you know, that we're missing those psychiatrists. Um, so they're still gonna be coming to your clinic <laughs> to get those medications and get those prescriptions. So how do we fill that gap? Um, and that's where we get into psychiatric access. So I wanna give just a real brief history of psychiatric access programs. Um, the first pilot was formed in 2002, um, and it was amid growing concerns around the number of children on Medicaid who are being prescribed psychiatric um, medications, and um, of those children, those who had multiple psychiatric medications. So it was skyrocketing, and that was just for the Medicaid population. So they were going, oh my gosh, we gotta do something about this. So in 2003 um, is when they developed the first program called Targeted Child Psychiatric Service. Um, and a year later, Dr. Strauss, who was also a pediatrician, adapted that model. And his vision was that mild or moderate to mental health issues could be managed and treated in a primary care setting with the support of telephonic child psychiatry consultation services, that this could be possible. And by doing this, it freed up the more complex cases and the more difficult specialized cases to go to the psychiatrist that might be in town. So that we were, instead of bottlenecking everyone into that behavioral health, and gee, just I hope they get there, that we're feeling some of those concerns in the practice where the primary care was and where the patient trusted and was going to show up. Um, this became the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Pro Project, right? Like these are all really long acronyms, I love them. MCPAP for short. Um, and from MCPAP, um, they have then expanded that to 20 different states, ours included. So the MCPAP project is where Beacon has developed CPAC and Cycline models from. So this is where it kind of came from. Um, if you're ever interested, you can look at the national network um, and they have a website that show all the different states and how they've taken that MCPAP model and kind of redefined it for each state um, and how it fits them. So for Massachusetts, it's a statewide project. They, they went full blast and it's, it's still going very strong. So these are the two programs that Beacon administers. The first is CPAC, and that's Colorado Psychiatric Access and Consultation for Kids. So this is the kid version. And then there's Psych Line, which is the adult version. The biggest difference between the two of these is where they're available. So that first map we talked about that had the 43 counties on it, CPAC is available for all 43 of those counties. So if you're in a primary practice in any of those counties, um, you can be a CPAC practice. Psychline is a specialized program and we partnered with the Center for Mental Health to develop this one um, because they came to us and said, hey, we love CPAC, but we need something for adults. What can we do? And so it was a partnership with the Center for Mental Health. So Psychline is available only in those six counties that the um, Center for Mental Health covers. So um, there we go. So there's three components to a psychiatric access program. 
So the first one is a psychiatric consultation. We frequently call this a curbside consultation. Um, it's a little bit easier to say. But essentially, it's just a consultation between that primary prescriber and the psychiatrist, whether it is an adult psychiatrist or a child psychiatrist, depending on which one they're accessing. Um, it provides them rapid access um, to needed resources. It reduces that demand for subspecialty and referring out and those types of things. Um, the, the consultation can be on the spot. So we will call, they could call and say, hey, you know what? I just had this patient show up and they were showing up for, you know, a cough. And then they tell me they're not sleeping well and they don't feel like their antidepressants are working. And I've done this, this, and this, but what do I do next? Where, where's my next step for this patient? What, what, what do I need to do? So they can call us and say, hey, I need, a, I need a consultation. I got someone here in the office. And we can usually get back to them within 30 minutes. They can also, for like the integrated models that do those morning huddles, you know who you've got coming in the door. So you may actually know in advance, hey, this patient is not sleeping well, they're not eating well, they're on an antidepressant, they say it's not working, that's why they're coming in today. I'm probably going to need a consult because I'm unclear as to what to do next, or I think I know what to do next, but I love a second opinion. So they can say, hey, I got this patient coming in. Can I get this consultation in advance of that patient? And that makes that appointment that much more efficient when that patient comes in. You can say, all right, this is what your complaint is. Um, here's where we're at. Here's what I'm recommending. And it makes it a little bit more fluid. So those are the two different options with that. The consultation time itself takes anywhere, we say five to 15 minutes. It's generally closer to like seven to 10 minutes. Um, so it's a real quick call. You know, physicians tend to be pretty, <laughs> pretty straight and to the point. Here's what I've got. This is what I need. Here's my symptoms. And our psychiatrists are the same. Here's what we've got. This is what I recommend. Here's a couple options for you. The second component to it is the behavioral health referral. Um, we call it care connection. So this is available um, for when you, you do need to refer someone for behavioral health services. So either you're an integrated practice and maybe they've run through their sessions, right, and you need some help referring them, or you're not an integrated practice and you would really like it if they would actually go to their behavioral health appointment. So this is a great way to sort of bridge that gap between the actual warm handoff of an integrated practice and being able to get someone to that appointment. So the way that these work um, is the, the practice just calls CPAC and says, hey, you know what, I need a behavioral health referral. Here's the information. And then we get all that information and we contact the parents directly and we say, hey, what do you need? What can we help you with? Tell us what's going on. What kind of provider are you looking for? Do you need a male provider, a female provider? What part of town are you in? Where do you want that provider to be? Um, for some of our rural areas, there's not as wide of a selection, <laughs> and that narrows down our, our questions, right? So we might be a little limited there. Um, but for a lot of those patients, they're used to just getting a list and saying, well, here's your insurance, here's your list. Good luck. Good luck, right? And it might be updated, you know, it, if you're lucky, um, you know, and they might still take that insurance or they might still have openings. So as a parent, you're, you're overwhelmed at that point and you're trying to go through this list and you're trying to find all these people um, and that's usually where it just dies on the vine, right? And that's, that's where it stops. So we cut some of that out. We get that information from that family. What are you looking for? Who would you like to see? Um, and then what insurance do you have? Because the great thing about CPAC is we are payer blind. So you don't have to worry about what dang insurance they have. You can say they just need this service. This is what they need and I'd like to get it to them. We do the calling around for the parents and we give them two to three options back. We say, you know, we call them back and say, all right, we called around. Here's two to three therapists that take your insurance, are taking appointments, and have availability to see you in the next five days, seven days, whatever it might be. So then they still have that choice between here's the providers I can call, here's who I'd like to see, um, and then they, can, they know that when they make that phone call, they take their insurance, they'll actually get an appointment. And it also increases that engagement. So that family is much more likely to actually go and make that appointment and show up for it because all of those barriers that frequently get in the way have been removed. And we found that our, our patients who go through that CPAC um, model are far more likely to show up for those appointments because the therapists on the other end say, gosh, we love getting those referrals because your people show up. 
<laughs> they actually show up. And for a Medicaid population, that's a big deal. Uh, you know, that's kind of that common stigma of like, well, they're Medicaid. I don't know if they're going to show up, right? And so it helps increase that engagement and that trust that when they get a referral through CPAC, they're going to keep getting those referrals through CPAC, which means there will be spots available for your clients when they need them. And the third component is education and training. So we do structured training for primary practices on specific behavioral health topics. And we do this in a variety of ways. We've had practices specifically request topics. Um, so it might be a specific diagnostic. Um, so then I'd be going, you know what? I'm seeing a ton of bipolar. I have no idea what to do with that. Like I, I got depression, I got anxiety, I'm good on those. But now I'm seeing something a little bit more complex, something that's a little bit more difficult to handle in a primary care setting. Um, but they're still going to come to see you. So what, what can I do? What questions should I ask? What, you know, how do I help serve this population? Um, the second component is that we do um, training on the psychotropic medications. So we actually utilize our teleconsultants to do that training. So a lot of the primary practices might say, you know, I, I got it. I got the diagnostics of it. I can recognize it. I got the assessment. I'm good on that. I have no idea how to medicate that. Or I have a couple of the basics, got that, but if I go beyond that, I'm not as comfortable. Um, and so we can then bring our teleconsultants in and we can do a, an on-site training. We've done them by phone, we've done them by you know, WebEx, we've done them in a variety of ways. Um, we do them over lunch so that we're you know, infringing on your lunch but not your patient load kind of thing. Um, so we do that in a number of ways to help those practices, because practices, a lot of times they know these patients are going to come see them. Like, they're going to come see you anyway, so what can I do to better improve my knowledge to serve who's coming through my doors? So those are the big three components of our uh, psychiatric access program. Um, and there was a little mention, the first two years that Beacon did this, it was under a grant. Um, so we had lots of great data that came from that. It was fantastic. Um, some of the high points, 89% um, of the primary care physicians screen more patients. 87% of them used more screening tools, and 88% of them were more comfortable addressing behavioral health issues in a primary care setting. 64% of them collaborated more with behavioral health specialists than they had prior to that two-year study. So since we've come out of that study, we still collect a lot of our call data and our call volume. And when we look at that, there's a real significant difference between urban areas and between our rural and frontier areas and what those practices use our services for. So that graph on the left is all, all of our data. So that's the entire CHIP region for 2016, uh, which includes those heavily populated urban areas. And you can see 87% of our calls are for behavioral health referrals, which I find really interesting because Compared to some of the rural and frontier areas, those urban areas have like a plethora of resources. I mean, I'm like, how do you not, you know, throw a rock without hitting one of them? But it's that time and that complexity and that patient engagement and that stigma that is still a significant barrier, even though you might have lots of choices for your behavioral health professionals. On the other side of it, for our rural areas, so we pulled out the urban areas of our data and looked at it, they significantly utilize us more for that psychiatric consultation. Um, and there's lots of ways that you could slice and dice that. I mean, the biggest one being, you know who you can refer to. Like there's only so, there's, yeah, there's only so many options and usually you're pretty good about knowing who your options are. But you're still kind of going, all right, I'd love to consult with someone on some medication. So that's how we see those two kind of utilized. And then you can additionally see here um, the results of those psychiatric consultations. So of the providers who called in and used that psychiatric consultation, 91% of them maintained their patient in their practice. This is regardless of whether that patient was on medication or not. So if they called in, um, it doesn't necessarily mean those patients go right on to medication. They might be saying, is it time for medication or what's some of my options? Um, so this is regardless of whether they were on meds or not, 91% of those were able to stay with their primary care physician. Only 9% of them required a referral out which is some great numbers, um, and really better for patient quality of care um, and all of those things we've already covered extensively today. So just for provider experience, I pulled out some quotes. So these are from both our post-consultation surveys that we do. So we have a survey after every consultation to ask that um, provider, okay, was that helpful? Did it meet your needs? Is that what you were looking for? And then we do biannual uh, practice surveys. So it's a little bit more extensive and covers behavioral health referrals and all those 
timeliness and all those great things we love to measure. Um, but these are quotes from all of our providers um, and what they're liking about the service, why they want to continue using the service and all those great warm and fuzzy things. So how to enroll? Um, I did want to put this in here because I'm sure it's a question that we'll get. There's a couple different ways. Um, for CPAC, um, as I mentioned before, you do need to be in that CHIP area. So that's, you know, 43 counties. I'm pretty sure we've got them covered. Um, and be a primary care provider. Um, and that could be a pediatric office. It could be a family care office. Any of those all fit into this model. For Cycline, you do need to be in the Center for Mental Health area in one of their six counties um, to have that program. And you can have both in your practice. Um, so you can be a CPAC practice and a Cycline practice, depending on the population that you serve. So the big point that I want to, to talk about with the, the psychiatric access is that this is something that can be layered into an integrated practice. Um, so you may have an integrated practice, you might have a behavioral health professional who might be co-located, you might have some version of what we've talked about today, but you still are missing that access to psychiatric consultation. So this is a great way to sort of plug that in and be able to keep your patients in your practice and be able to maintain them, see them, and meet all of their needs while they're there.